Hello, hello, good evening everyone, good evening and welcome. So, here we are once again, ready to start a new lesson. Um, hopefully you guys had an amazing weekend and are ready to hit it hard, as they say. And uh, yeah, we can continue learning. So, just as a reminder, we are going to be working tonight on the, what is going to be basically the last class before we go into a short break. That means that um, we're going to have an opportunity when we get to um, the next week to rest a little bit, to have some off time. And um, yeah, I mean, you're going to have the option, you know, to um, to practice even more if possible. So um, that is going to be part of what's going to happen. Now, for this evening, what the idea that we're going to be following is to continue doing a little bit of the reading practice that we were doing on Thursday, because I think it was only two of you guys who had the chance to do the reading practice. Um, we are also going to be going into the platform and checking on some of the activities that you guys have developed um, here in the platform. Because, well, I just want to see how well we're doing in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, the, the actual activities or the exercises that we have to develop. So I want to do a little bit of a check on how well we are doing on that area. And, well, apart from all of that, of course, you guys remember that we are going to also be doing a little bit of um, well, well, the question for the night, you know, we are going to do a little bit of a practice before we get started with anything, um, with the question. And for tonight, it's going to be a relatively simple question. It's not going to be anything too hard because we are going to be discussing, um, basically just, um, the weekend. So how your weekend went and, um, yeah, basically that's what we're going to be doing. Um, as I said, we're going to continue doing a little bit of our reading practice. We're also going to be um, checking on, well, the exercises on the platform. And we are as well going to be, um, I think we're going to have some time to talk about um, simple past and uh, present perfect, which is going to be, well, part of the sections that we need to cover during, you know, during well, the topics that we have to discuss. So before anything, we're going to get then into the question for the night. As I said, tonight, we're going to be talking about your weekends, how your weekends went. So the first person on sharing, I think it's going to be, um, let's see, Osmin. So tell us, Osmin Rivera, how was your weekend? So you can Good evening, teacher. Yes, 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 yes. Confirm, I can hear you. Yes, teacher, I hear. Yeah, so um, tell me, how was your weekend? I, 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 I stay with my family. I stay in my home. Uh, I go to shopping. Okay. Uh, only, only this. All right. So you stay with family, stay home, and also, uh, when shopping. Great. Very good. Sounds, you know, like one of those calm weekends that sometimes we have. So it doesn't bother anyone to sometimes have some relaxation during uh a co a couple days or a couple hours. So very good. Thank you very much for sharing, Osmin. Sounds like you had a nice, um, a nice time during the weekend. Very good. Moving on. Uh, now we're gonna hear a little bit from Lisbeth. How about you, Lisbeth? How was your weekend? My weekend was terrible because all I did was homework. Even my back hurts yesterday. Yeah, yeah that happens. That happens sometimes. We can sometimes can be harsh on one. So yeah, doing a lot of homework is also not the best way of spending a weekend. I remember those days. I remember when I had to do tons of homework um, because, well, 
I needed to finish, I don't know, a report or maybe a writing or something like that. So yeah, I can relate. I can relate to those moments when, you know, you have those um, horrible days when nothing goes as you planned and you have to do a lot of things. So yeah, bad, sad for you. All right, uh, moving on. How about the case of um, Laura? How was your weekend, Laura Lopez? Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My case, uh, I spent time with my family and I watched uh, TV and listened uh, and, uh, music too. I only take, take a rest, mm -hmm. only that. Okay, very good. So yeah, listening to music, as we were discussing on last Wednesday, can also be um, refreshing and also relaxing. Oh, no, wait. I think it was on Thursday, actually. But anyway, listening to music is something that um, can get us to relax. And it's one of those nice activities to do during the weekend. So great. Very good. Um, let's see about Romeo. How about you, Romeo? How was your weekend? Hi, teacher. Hey there. I'm sorry. There you are. Uh, um, really, I I didn't do anything. Okay. I stayed at home <laughs> all weekend. Okay, so no watching movies, no watching, no listening to music or something like that. No watching uh, sports. Yes, I watch uh, the the suit the a series of Netflix the. Mm -hmm. How, how is the pronunciation? Uh, suit. Suit. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can. Um, I start to watch the the suit. Um, that's all, really. Okay. I no no is another. <laughs> you didn't do much then. All right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> that's okay. You know, sometimes it's a well-deserved rest. So nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, very good. So I also did start watching something this weekend. I started watching Jujutsu Kaisen. I remember last Thursday we were discussing something about that. And um, I started it and I'm loving it. So yeah, that series, Suits, I have also been recommended. Uh, many people have told me that it's a very good series. I haven't watched it yet. I think it has two different versions. I think there's one that is Mm, Korean. I don't know if it, if it's actually Korean or, or or if it is Japanese, and there is also the American one. So, yeah, they they say that uh, it's a very nice series. So maybe you know maybe it's gonna be something that I'll watch sometime. So great! It's great that you spend some time you know just relaxing at home. Very good. Yes, really, really is a good series because I don't know yet. Um, I like uh, to watch because uh, there uh, new words, uh, new vocabulary mm -hmm. to me. Uh, very it's good. Very interesting. Uh, it's a little difficult too. Yeah, that happens. You know, sometimes. Well, many teachers have like recommendations for series that you can watch if you want to acquire new vocabulary. In my case, one that I have been recommended, I don't do that too much because, I mean, people have different tastes. So I prefer not to go ahead and, you know, like recommend you guys to watch something. You can watch anything. What I do normally is that I recommend you to watch whatever it is that you like. Just watch it in English because in that way, I'm not, you know, getting into your taste on like what you want, what you like to watch or listen to. Uh, but many teachers do have that um how can we call it like characteristic um in my case many of my teachers from even from high school they recommended the series friends i don't know if you guys ever heard about it uh but they say that the reason why friends is a very good series for people who are um learning english it because is because it uses a lot of like slang it also has a lot of like day-to-day -day communication day-to-day -day conversation so you get to acquire the knowledge related to that, related to like um, just going ahead in public and talking to people. Um, I don't know, maybe just making orders at a restaurant, things like those, or just joking around with your friends. So you can get 
you know, to listen to all those um, different levels of vocabulary. And that is why people, or many teachers at least, recommend watching Friends when you're learning English. In my case, what I will recommend you, or I mean, no, 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 not that. I would not recommend you to to watch anything specifically. But the thing is that that recommendation, I only took it um, for a couple weeks or months. And then I switched into watching The Big Bang Theory. I don't know if that rings a bell, but uh, it was, for me, it was more interesting because of the same reason that you say, because it has more um, like difficult vocabulary and the characters are a little bit trickier. Like you get to, to experience things from a different perspective and uh, like there is more jokes even. So the series goes, you know, about many other topics, not only about friendship and about day-to-day -day life. Romeo, what are you going to say? Sorry. Yes, but I, it's similar to with a friend's choose. It is similar. Vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is similar because you have a lot of like the same kind of conversation that comes between, you know, a group of friends. But at the same time, you have some scientific terms, you have some... Uh, historical terms because you, they talk about people from history and things like those in friends they do talk more about like family about work about things like you know the daily life but in big the big one theory the the thing that i like is the fact that they use more um how can we call it more uh distinctive vocabulary it was not something too specific or too regular so yeah if you guys are eager to go ahead and watch something in English because you want to practice your listening. There you have two different examples. I don't know where you can stream them nowadays because, you know, they switched from here to there. I remember that friends used to be in Netflix, then they went to Amazon. I think that now they're in HBO. So friends is like all over the place, I think. The Big One Theory, I think that one is in HBO, so you can watch it there. Um, so yeah, it's all over the place. But uh, moving on. Let's get to hear from Jorge. How about you, Jorge? How was your weekend? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my weekend, uh, in uh, Saturday in the morning, I went, uh, I went shopping mm -hmm. in the afternoon. We went to uh, Centralist uh, Historico mm -hmm. uh, to visit of the new of the old building. Um, Sunday, we went to eat with my family, and that's all, teacher. Okay, sounds like a very nice weekend to you guys. Very good. That sounds like you had some fun. Uh, so, yeah, I have never been to Centro Historico. That's a fun fact because I have tried a couple times, but I actually have never been. I have seen some beautiful videos that they say it's it's just an amazing place to go, mostly nowadays that it has been like reorganized, but uh, I haven't had the chance just yet. So hopefully I will get it, you know, in a in a in a short time. Because I don't know when I'm going to go back to San Salvador. It sounds like the country is so big, right? But no, uh, I don't know when, you know, I'll, I'll have the chance once again to, to visit. But sounds very good. Sounds like you had a very good weekend. All right. Uh, moving on, the last two people we're going to hear from Maria. Maria, Lo Maria Dolores, how about you? How was your weekend? Hi, everybody. Hi. Good evening. In my, during my weekend, I went to Finca San Cristobal in, on the San Salvador volcano. Mm -hmm. um, every day, uh, um, with a nice cool climate, warm coffee and delicious lunch. And then Sunday work 24 hours. Oh, okay. Well, things that happen, you know, sometimes you have to do that. But still, I feel like you are um, relaxed now, or at least it feels like that. Uh, but yeah, spending some time in nature, going to the volcano sounds like a very good plan. And uh, also, as you said, 
the cool climate, I can not doubt that it gets people in a good mood, you know, to spend some time in the cool climate and also enjoying, well, your lunch, as you said. So very good. Sounds like uh, you did have an amazing weekend. So nice, nice, nice. All right. And the last Thank for the night, you're very welcome. The last for the night is going to be, let me see, you, Alexa. Tell us, how was your weekend? I can I can barely hear you. I don't know what's going on with your microphone. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Now it's better. Um, on Saturday, I just stay at home. I just watch Grey's Anatomy. Racking. And on Sunday, I went with my family to the Pacific Lake. Oh. Yeah, I just stayed the whole day there. And I was doing my homework too. Okay, so working on the way, working on the trip. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that happens. I have been there. Been there, done that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, it sounds like you guys had some great weekends. And also, well, I was meaning to ask, is it the first time that you watched Grey's Anatomy? Or is it like a second run, third run? It's the third run. Third run? Yeah, okay. Yes. So you are basically the same as my girlfriend because she has been just going crazy about watching it for the fourth time i mean so. i watch it for the first time station 19 it's like uh i don't know it's like a okay well in my case i have never really watched the whole thing like i have only watched a few episodes uh when they were streaming it in Warner I think it was in Warner so yeah. when they were streaming it in Warner I used to watch a few episodes here and there uh and also now that I'm with her sometimes when I go have lunch with her she likes to watch Grey's Anatomy while she's um also having lunch and I'm like sometimes it's so disgusting because they have you know those all the creepy things happening on on the screen and she's just having lunch like nothing and I mean, me, me as well. It's not like I, I'm, you know, the kind of guy who's going to get just disgusted because of that. But um, yeah, it's just like interesting. I mean, I didn't know she had the stomach for that to watch all the blood and, and veins and things and also eat at the same time. But Grey's Anatomy, another, another great series. Are you watching it in English, Alexa? Yes. I'm okay. watching it in English. Very good. Great. There we go. All right, so I just sent you guys a phrase here in the chat. Been there, done that. Eh, eso lo usé hace ratito cuando Alexa dijo, ¿verdad? De que hizo la tarea mientras iba al lago o cuando fue al lago. Esta frase ustedes la pueden utilizar siempre que estén hablando acerca de algo. O sea, las demás personas, ¿verdad? Eh, o alguien con quien ustedes estén hablando, estén hablando acerca de algo que ustedes han hecho. Principalmente también se usa con cosas que son como especiales, o sea, cosas extrañas, ¿sí? No necesariamente vamos a decir como, yo he respirado y yo le, yo le voy a decir, I've been there, done that. No, sino que puede ser, digamos, um, qué sé yo, me he bañado solo en ropa interior en la playa, por decir algo. Entonces, ustedes pueden decir, oh, been there, done that, ¿sí? O sea, he estado ahí, he hecho eso. A eso se refiere el decir el been there, done that. Pero es como les digo, con cosas especiales, con cosas extrañas, no necesariamente lo vamos a usar eh, con cualquier cosa pues, peculiar, con que alguien diga, ah, yo fui al súper el otro día. O sea, no, sino que, por ejemplo, puede ser, fíjense que yo tengo la costumbre de que voy al súper, me tomo los yogurts y los pago ya solo en muy botecito. That might be something when you can say, oh, been there, done that. See, it's something that I have done a few times. So that's why, I, you know, that example came to my mind. Um, what else can it be? For example, um, if... You are the kind of people who like to ask people from call centers, like to practice English in, in like the public transportation. You can also relate, you know, like saying Binder done that is very similar to the next phrase that I will send is uh, you can say I can relate. Or you can only say can relate. OK, either of them are OK. You can say I can relate or can relate. It's basically the same as saying been there, done that. Entonces, son frases que pueden utilizar simplemente para hacer un comentario, ¿verdad? Como, ah, ya, sí, te entiendo. O sea, like, yo he hecho eso. 
Entonces, eh, ambas, tanto el, el decir, been there, done that, como el I can relate o can relate, pues vienen dándose, ¿verdad? Para el mismo, um, qué sé yo, para la misma idea. Something, another example, for ex it happens to me almost all the time. Like when I have to pay for Spotify, I always forget it. And Spotify is always sending me emails like, hey, you're back on the, on the pay. And I'm like, oh, okay, so now I have to or either deposit money or transfer money from my other account so I can pay Spotify. If it ever happens to you, you can say, huh, can relate. Yeah, so it's something that uh, it has happened to you before. Uh, or if you're the kind of people who goes to different pupuserias and doesn't like to have the new pupusa, and uh, you're basically like me, so you can relate to that as well. All right. Bueno, les decía, ¿verdad? Y vamos a hacer una práctica de esto. Esta es eh, pues la práctica de lectura que teníamos la semana pasada. Me interesa mucho que al menos unas tres personas esta noche lo hagan. No necesariamente vamos a hacerlo todos, pero al menos unas tres personas. Les dije, ¿verdad? Que eh, traten de ir haciendo esto. Práctica de lectura. No crean que a mí se me va a olvidar. Si ya les dije que hay dinero de por medio, no se me va a olvidar. Eh, traten de ir leyendo, traten de ir estudiando, traten de ir practicando lectura, porque pues el último día de la clase vamos a tener un espacio para poder hacer esto también, para poder leer un par de párrafos y de verdad, la persona que lo lea más rápido, pues se lleva el premio, ¿verdad? Dependiendo, a veces me emociono, ya en el último día me pongo a subir a, 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 a lo que les doy, así que, if I was you, if I was you, I will practice. Okay, so once again, we have these two readings. I am going to do a proofreading right now so that you guys remember some of the things, some of the words. Um, after that, si ya se fijaron, no sé si fijaron que mostré esto por un momento, que era, a ver, this thing over here, esto, vamos a estar trabajando un poco en esto, yo tengo algunas adelantadas, pero pues simplemente, a ver, vamos a trabajar en las que no tengo resueltas, eh, esas de aquí, porque me interesa saber, verdad, que, que lo llevemos eso también de forma correcta, siempre es importante hacer uno que otro chequeo de vez en cuando de los, de los knowledge checks, así si alguno, verdad, se ha quedado, si alguno de ustedes se le, se le complicó alguno, pues en ese caso eh, podemos ir solventando o pues simplemente nos vamos pasando un poquito de copia, ¿verdad? Pero bueno, antes de llegar a eso, we're going to work on this, el, el reading practice. So we have it over here. The first one, it's about Mary Curie. Now, eh, the reading goes as following. Mary Curie was one of the most accomplished scientists in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered radium, an element widely used for treating cancer, and studied uranium and other radioactive substances. Pierre and Mary's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secrets of the atom. Mary was born in 1867 in Warsaw, Poland, where her father was a professor of physics. At an early age, at an early age she displayed a brilliant mind and a brittle personality. Her great exuberance um, for learning prompted her to continue with her studies after high school. She became disgruntled, however, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women. Determined to receive a higher education, she defiantly left Poland and in 1891 entered a, the Sovereign, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. Marie was fortunate to have studied at the Sovereign Uh, with some of the greatest scientists of her day, one of whom was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1895 and spent many productive years working together in the physics laboratory. Y tenemos el siguiente. Ese es el de uh, Mount Vesuvius. ¿sí? Solamente estoy haciendo una proofreading después que hayamos teni tenido ya la oportunidad de practicar algunos de ustedes. En ese momento sí les voy a hablar acerca de las eh, de las diferentes palabras, el vocabulario nuevo que puede haber aquí y tendrán ustedes también la oportunidad de preguntar, ¿verdad? Cualquier cosa que se les ocurra acerca de, pues, principalmente eso, el vocabulario que se pueden encontrar, cualquier palabra que se les haga complicada. Así que si de momento hay alguna que ustedes se quedan como, ¿qué significa eso? Vamos a regresar aquí para poder revisar ambos, tanto el de Mary Curie como el de Mount Vesuvius. So, Mount Vesuvius, the reading goes as following. Mount Vesuvius, a volcano located between the ancient Italian cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, has received much attention because of its frequent and destructive eruptions. The most famous of these eruptions occurred in AD 79. The volcano had been inactive for centuries. There was little warning of the coming eruption, although one account unearthed by 
archaeologist says that a hard rain and a strong wind has disturbed the celestial calm during the preceding night. Early the next morning, the volcano poured a huge river of molten rock down upon Herculaneum, completely burying the city and filling the harbor with the coagulated lava. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, cinders, stone, and ash rained down on Pompeii. The sparks from the burning ash ignited the um, combustible rooftops quickly. Large portions of the city were destroyed in the conflagration. Fire, however, was not the only cause of destruction. Poisonous sulfuric gases saturated the air. These heavy gases were not buoyant and in the atmosphere and therefore sank towards the earth and suffocated people. Okay, entonces esas son las dos lecturas. Uh, sorry. Uh, ahora sí, quisiera ver o quisiera conocer quiénes son dos o tres eh, voluntarios a quienes les gustaría practicar. Ya la semana pasada tuvimos, me parece que fue Laura, eh, Alexa, I think we also had, I don't remember who else, la verdad. Um, sorry, Alexa, yes? Uh, actually, I didn't finish. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you got interrupted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Okay, so if you would like to finish today, then it's your time. Okay, uh, sure. Beginning or? It will be better. I think it will be better, oh, yeah, okay. from the beginning. Just for the okay. practice. Uh, Mercury was one of the most accomplished scientists in history, together with her husband, Pierre. She discovered radium, an element widely used for treating cancer, and studied uranium and other radioactive substances. Pierre and Marie's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secret of the atom. Mary, Mary was born in 1977 in Warsaw, Poland, where her father was a professor of physics. At an early age, she displayed a brilliant mind and a blue personality. Her great tolerance for learning prompted her to continue with her studies after high school. She became the discovery, however, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women. Determined to receive a higher education, she definitely left Poland and in 1991 entered the so-called French University, where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. And Mary was a person was fortunate to have studied at the third one with some of the greatest scientists of the book for day. One of whom was clear to me, Mary, and Peter were married in 1895 and spent many productive sort of years working together in the physics laboratory. All right, very good. Very, very nice. Uh, so now I see that I also have uh, Maria as one of the possible people. So Maria, if you feel ready, which one would you like to read? This one or the one about the volcano? Uh, the Mary Curie. Okay, go ahead then. Okay. Mary Curie was one of the, of the most accomplished scientists Scientist? in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered radium in element with use for treating cancer and study uranium in the radioactive substance. Pierre and Mary amicable, amicable uh, collaboration with leather help to unlock the secret um, of the atom. Mary was born in 1896 in Washington, Poland, where her father was a pro professor in physics at an early age. She displayed a brain mind, mind and breathed personality. Her great exuberance for learning prompted her to continue with her study after high school. She became disgruntled, however, when she learned that the university in classroom was closing the woman determined to receive a higher education, she definitely 
left Poland in 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 ninety nine no eighteen ninety one mm -hmm. entering the Sorbonne I French University where she had her master degree and doctorate in physics. Mary has was fortunate in to have studied at the summer with some of the greatest scientists of her day. One of when was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1995 and spent many productive year, years working together in the to in the physics laboratory. Very good. There we go. Great. Good, good, good. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, Mariela, which one would you like to read? This one or the one about the volcano? This one. All right. Go ahead then. Marie Curie was of the most accomplished scientist in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered radium, an element widely used for treating cancer, and studied uranium and other radioactive substances. Pierre and Mary's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secrets of the 80s. Mary was born in 1867 in Warsaw, Poland where her father was a professor of physics at an early age. She displayed a brilliant mind and a vital personality. Her great exuberance for learning prompted her to continue with her studies after high school. She became disgruntled, however, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women. Determined to receive a higher education, she defiantly left Poland and in 1891, entered the Sorbonne, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. Mary was fortunate to have studied at the Sorbonne with some of the greatest sciences of her day, one of whom was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1895 and spent many productive years working together in the physics laboratory. All right, very good, very, very good. That was a really nice pace. Um, how about you, Lisbeth? Let's hear from you. Which one would you like to read? This one or the one about the volcano? This one. All right. Okay. Mary Curie was one of the most accomplished scientists in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered uranium, an element widely used for treating cancer, and studied uranium and other radioactive systems. Pierre and, Mary, and Mary's amicable collaboration later, later helped to unlock the secrets of the atom. Mary was born in 1867 in Barça, Poland, where her father was a professor of physics. At an early age, she displayed a brilliant mind and a bright personality. Her great exuberance for learning prompted, prompted her to continue with her study after high school. She became disgruntled. However, when she learned that the, that the universe in Barça was close to women, determined to receive a higher education, she defiantly left Poland and in 1891 entered to the suburb, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. Mary was a fortunate to have a study at the suburb with some of the greatest scientists of her day, one of whom was Perry Curry. Mary and Perry were married in 1895 and spent many productive years working together in the physics laboratory. All right, very nice. I like that, very, very good. Okay, so now that we have practiced and read this um, paragraphs, mainly this one about Mary Curry, uh, I would like to know, do you guys have any questions related to um, to vocabulary from these words? No necesariamente solo los que han leído, sino incluso, ¿verdad? Todos ustedes. ¿Alguna duda que tengan acerca de las palabras que están acá? Eh, ¿Alguna que, que, que no conozcan? ¿Quisieran conocer cuál es el significado de ellas? ¿O do you think you have full knowledge of all the words in, this, um, in these paragraphs over here? Yes, teacher. I... What is the meaning? This ground hole. 
at the second paragraph at the four line okay. yes here oh wait perdón se pasó just granted this one over here just yes. a second i'm going to point it with the laser so here uh just granted this one is uh a synonym of getting mad like when you're just granted is when you're mad when you don't like something so it's basic, basically when you say, <clears throat> sorry, it's like the middle between being mad and being disappointed. So this translate is like, estoy decepcionado. ¿sí? So basically that's what happened. It's between, you know, pero es un poquito más que ir solo de decepción, ¿verdad? Decepcionado es como si dijéramos, I'm disappointed. Pero es como que me siento triste nada más. Pero this translate is entre el decep la decepción y el enojo. So this translate would be like a, a stronger, um, disappointment we have prompt hey, thank also you. you're very welcome so prompt prompt is something that we use or the word that we use when we want to to talk about um something that pushes me something that gives me the energy to do something like um if you see someone who is struggling to go across the street then there might be a feeling that prompts you to help that person. So when something prompts you, es como algo que nos, eh, nos impulsa a hacer algo. So if I feel prompted by something, it's when something is going to, you know, uh, give me that idea, give me that um, strength for me to go ahead and do something about that person. All right. Any other word that you guys may will, or would like to get to know? Seems like no. Muy bien. Entonces, supongo que eh, también entendemos bastante bien, ¿verdad? ¿A qué se puede, se puede utilizar esta palabra? El blithel, blith, 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 sí, blith. Um, personality, esta palabrita de aquí, se utiliza cuando hablamos acerca de alegre. O sea, cuando alguien tiene una, pues en este caso, describiendo la personalidad. So, a blithel uh, personality es alguien que es alegre, ¿verdad? Por otro lado... Esta palabra, amicable. Amicable la utilizamos cuando eh, nos referimos a amigable, o sea, tener una, una relación amigable. No necesariamente vamos a utilizar siempre la palabra friendly, sí, sino que también, ¿verdad? Puede ser um, amicable, sí. Amicable collaboration, amicable friendship. Eh, esta es un poco más como relacionada, ¿verdad? También a las personas que... Eh, ¿Cómo decirlo? ¿Que son pareja? O sea, o que en algún punto más adelante fueron pareja. En este caso, ya que es un párrafo tomado de la historia, o sea, se usa más, a, más que todo el amicable, ya que más adelante ellos se convirtieron en pareja y eso es algo ya sabido. Así que por eso es más recomendado no utilizar la palabra friendly, ¿sí? Porque ya sabemos eh, eso, ¿verdad? El, el decir, um, pues que ellos después fueron pareja. Muy bien, vamos a ver este otro. We have the one about the volcano. Let me see. Doesn't want to go. So there we go. This one about Mount Vesuvius. Is there any word over here that you guys may not know? Alguna palabra que no conozcan aquí. Aquí no le voy a creer que me digan que las conocen todas porque hay un montón de palabras raras. So tell me, which words do you guys not know in this uh, in these paragraphs? Así como no lo leyó nadie hoy, por eso es más difícil también que, que la encuentren, ¿verdad? Pero, yes. Teacher. Yes. Hi. 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 Uh, I want the meaning of the, uh, the last. Uh, therefore. Therefore. Let me see. Therefore, therefore, therefore. Where is it? Esta vez se me perdió. Paragraph. Ok, solo que voy a esperar que se quite, que tengo aquí la, la, la... Bueno, no importa, no importa que no lo vea. Pero el punto, therefore, when we use therefore, uh, we use it when we want to talk about something that happens as a reason. Sí, as a reason of something else. Entonces, si yo digo therefore, eh, estoy refiriéndome a que, a decir por lo tanto, por decir así, por lo tanto, so therefore, sí, es a raíz de, a raíz de, de esto, sucede lo otro. So, there you have it. When you use therefore, it's basically for that. Uh, así aquí está. And therefore they sank. Entonces, 
debido a eso, ¿verdad? We're talking about the, um, the particles or the, the heavy gases, not necessarily the particles, but the heavy gases. And they say, it, or the, the, the phrase says that it, they were not buoyant in the atmosphere. Eso significa, ¿verdad? Que no podían flotar. So when you have something that is buoyant, significa que es eh, algo que pues tiene la capacidad, ¿verdad? De flotar, algo que tiene la capacidad de mantenerse en altura, digamos. But here they were not buoyant, therefore they sank. Entonces, a raíz de eso, pues eh, se hundían, ¿verdad? Hacia la tierra. Okay, then we have meanwhile. Meanwhile, when we use meanwhile, we're referring to um, during that time. So we are going to have it, or where is it? Meanwhile. Let me see. No lo encuentro ahorita. Oh, in, para, in three at the third paragraph. Third paragraph? Yes. At the, at the, at the, at the beginning. Oh, dang it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, meanwhile. Word. Meanwhile. Yeah, meanwhile. Esa es una similar. Meanwhile, al igual que la palabra que teníamos acá atrás, el, el however, que estaba en una, en una parte de la, del, de lo, del segundo párrafo de acerca de la lectura de Mary Curry, son frases muy utilizadas en la lectura en la escritura perdón profesional eh, en este caso aquí meanwhile eh, va a entenderse como mientras tanto sí el párrafo anterior verdad donde venía contando algunas de las cosas que estaban pasando eh, en este caso era acerca de Herculanum sí las cosas que estaban pasando de ese lado en esa en esa comunidad vamos a decir Ciudad puede ser, no sé, honestamente esto sí no lo conozco al 100%, si estas eran ya conocidas como ciudades, o sea, si eran ciudades grandes, ciudades bien establecidas, la que sí se crea una ciudad grande y que eso, de hecho, esto va a contestar la duda que tenía Mayra, es acerca de Pompey o Pompeya, ¿sí? Esa sí yo sé que era una ciudad. Herculeneum no lo he buscado en realidad, así que por eso les digo, no sé si era una ciudad o si simplemente era un poblado, pero... Eh, aquí nos está contando en este párrafo acerca de todas las cosas que estaban pasando ahí. Entonces, al utilizar el meanwhile, se utiliza al principio de la frase, porque lo que, del, del párrafo, perdón, porque lo que yo voy a hacer es que estoy introduciendo qué estaba pasando mientras tanto, meanwhile, sí, mientras tanto, del otro lado. Y luego, pues ahí mismo tenemos eso mismo, ¿verdad? On the other side of the mountain, sí. O sea, al otro lado de la montaña. Entonces... Este meanwhile se utiliza para referirse a mientras tanto. Um, ¿En cosas de la vida cotidiana se puede utilizar? Sí. Yo puedo decir, por ejemplo, my kids were watching TV meanwhile, pero eso es como más, es, es como más extraño, digamos. Lo más común en la vida cotidiana, y por eso les digo que es mucho más común esto que se use en la escritura profesional, lo más común sería decir solo while. I was um, watching or doing the dishes, While my kids uh, were watching TV. Pero eh, se puede también utilizar el meanwhile, sí. O sea, que se refiere a, pues, específicamente a eso. Mientras tanto, I was doing the dishes while, or meanwhile, my kids were watching TV. Pero como les digo, suena un poquito extraño porque no es la costumbre, ¿verdad? La costumbre es utilizar el while. Que solamente se refiere a mientras. Mientras, no necesariamente el mientras tanto. Por otro lado, on earth it. A ver, earth it, esa es una palabra compuesta, sí. Earth it se refiere a cosas que están enterradas, o sea, pero no enterradas necesariamente eh, a propósito, sí. Eso sería buried, buried. Sí, earth it es, son cosas que han quedado soterradas, por decir así. Entonces, buried sería cuando hablamos acerca de cosas eh, aterradas, o sea, cosas que, se, que están bajo tierra a propósito. En cambio, Earthed son cosas que a raíz del tiempo fueron quedando ahí, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, cuando utilizamos el Unearthed, y ustedes se fijan también en la siguiente palabra que se utiliza, Archaeologist, podemos generar ahí, ¿verdad? Un enlace. Unearthed by Archaeologist, entonces, significa que se refiere a desenterradas, descubiertas por arqueólogos. Entonces, aquí esto se va a entender, although one account on earth it, será verdad una eh, como un encuentro o un dato, sí, un, un encuentro o un dato eh, desenterrado por arqueólogos 
y ya lo demás pues dice que había una fuerte lluvia y eh, fuertes vientos que también habían eh, disturbed, sería como distorsionado o eh, enturbecido el cielo, la calma celestial de la noche eh, anterior, ¿verdad? Entonces, Onerded va a ser utilizado cuando hablamos acerca de desenterrar algo que fue enterrado de forma natural, o sea, que fue, eh, que quedó soterrado, que con el tiempo fue quedando bajo tierra. Ok, then we have uh, Pompey, ya les dije que Pompey es una ciudad, ¿verdad? Eh, acerca de donde estaba este, el monte Vesubios. Eh, luego tenemos Ignited. Ignited se usa cuando vamos a hablar acerca de encender algo. O sea, por ejemplo, um, los juegos art artificiales que utilizamos, fuegos artificiales, perdón, que utilizamos, o sea, los cohetes, va. Eh, they are ignited. Entonces significa que los encendemos. So anything that you guys can, like, simply just get to burn is something that can get ignite, ignited. Um, even some people, I mean, it, this word is also used when you talk about feelings. Um, there are people who say that they can get ignited relatively quickly. What do they mean by that? Si ustedes ya han visto la película de Disney, ah, se me fue el nombre ahorita y la tenía justo en mente. Sé que dice mente. Eh, curiosamente, no, no es curiosamente. Ah, dang it. Intensamente. Intensamente, esa. So, you guys have seen Intensamente, ¿verdad? Y ven que furia, o sea, o enojo, I don't know what his name is in Spanish, but him, uh, normalmente lo que hace cuando se enoja es que se enciende. Entonces, a eso se refiere el decir el ignited. So, um, esa palabra, como les digo, se puede utilizar también en sentimientos, no solo en cosas literalmente que se encienden. O sea, like, if I say, I get ignited easily, significa que ustedes son personas que se enojan con facilidad. Entonces, eh, para eso se usa ¿verdad? también el ignited. Así que para encender, básicamente, o prender fuego a algo. So that's ignited. Um, ignition, por otro lado, se puede entender como el inicio de algo. Eh, el inicio, por ejemplo, o el hecho de encender un motor, el hecho de poner a andar eh, un motor, eso puede entenderse, ¿verdad? Como ignition, give it ignition. Esas son palabras que no necesariamente se usan tan comúnmente del lado de Estados Unidos, porque, eh, bueno, no sé si he comentado esto, pero en mi caso yo soy fanático de la Fórmula 1 y usan mucho en la Fórmula 1 una palabra que es trocho. Sí, al otro día con mi hermana estábamos practicando decirla porque es extraña, throttle, y en inglés, eso es básicamente pues en, en inglés británico, ¿verdad? En el inglés americano, lo que utilizan o lo que más fácil, o sea, sí dicen throttle a veces, pero lo más común es que simplemente dicen gas, ¿sí? Entonces les digo esto porque pasa muy a menudo que algunas palabras, eh, simplemente lo que sucede es que no las usan en el inglés eh, americano, porque vaya, la palabra ignited, para hablar acerca de poner a andar algo, de poner en marcha un motor, en inglés, o sea, en Estados Unidos, es mucho más común que se diga start. Sí, o sea, simplemente es empezar, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, se entiende, muchos, nosotros, muchos de nosotros entendemos el encender un motor con start, pero ignite podría ser quizás la mejor forma, ya que, pues si ustedes no saben, dentro de un motor hay un montón de explosiones repetitivas y pues a raíz de eso es que también se utiliza verdad de la palabra de ignited pero igual o sea son cosas que no son comunes eh, de este lado del charco y pues normal verdad que a veces nos confundamos o se nos hagan raras esas, ese tipo de palabras bueno pero como les decía son simplemente algunas cositas que pasan eh, sí Alex Actually, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen this movie? Which Pompeii? one? Pompey? Yes. I have seen it um like as an as a as a, an ad, but I have never watched it. Oh no. it's very good. Okay. So I like movies about like natural destructions. So yeah, maybe, you know, I'll I'll try it. So it's kind of sad, but yeah, you will like it. Okay, thanks for the recommendation. Then it might be something that I can spend a few hours in, in, in a few days. I'll let you know. 
actually, I wanted to share with you guys, or with Ruth specifically, I like the song, Ruth, the one that you recommended me, Um, I think it was last Thursday, the Stand Up, it was very good, I liked it, I liked it very, very much, I listened to it like three times during the weekend, so yeah, it means that I really liked it. I like the vibe of that kind of song, like, you know, the voice of the of the singer, how it sounds like the vibrations that she um, that she has in her in her vocal cords. I don't know why. I just have some kind of a special love for that kind of music. So thank you very much for that recommendation. And I might also come back to you, Alexa, in a few days and let you know that I liked um, the, the movie Pompeii. So, no, I have not watched it, but I will try. Uh, now we have the last word, uh, at least the ones that you guys have let me know right now, which is buoyant. Buoyant, I told you a little bit earlier about um, the meaning of it. We use buoyant to refer to things that can float, ¿sí? Para referirnos a cosas que pueden, uh, que pueden flotar. O sea, no necesariamente solo en el aire. Eso es algo bien importante tomar en cuenta. Buoyant can be used also for things that can float above water. So that's why we also have buoys. Las boy las See, ¿Sí? boyas que se utilizan en el mar. Um, so that is why we call them that, because they are floating over um, the water. So yeah, anything that is buoyant can relate to something that can float, has the ability to float. And in this case, we're talking about the gases and the gases, they say that we're not buoyant. Normally gases are easily, like when a gas escapes its container, it just expands and goes through the air and normally floats to the atmosphere. As one of the biggest examples is CO2 or um, dioxido de carbono. That is one of the most um, common gases that we have on Earth and is one of those buoyant gases. Like it normally just goes up to the atmosphere. Same that happens with helium. Si sí, ustedes han, han visto eso muy a menudo, me imagino, el helio, ¿verdad? Como, o sea, hace que incluso otras cosas puedan flotar. So that is what we mean by buoyant. Ahora, una palabra aquí importante que de hecho nadie preguntó sería esta, del molten rock. When we, have, when we talk about molten rock, ¿tienen idea de qué se refiere o hablar acerca de molten rock? A huge river o molten rock. Como río de roca, algo así. Mm -hmm. Pero, fundido. Eh, wow. Exacto, fundidas o derretidas, sí. Wow. El molten es básicamente el adjetivo que utilizamos eh, como en reemplazo para poder describir cosas así, ¿verdad? Como esto, en reemplazo de la palabra melt. Sí. Si ustedes alguna vez han, han probado esa hamburguesa en, en Wendy's, que es donde normalmente la venden, el melt pues se entiende como eso, ¿verdad? Como algo derretido. Entonces, molten sería para poder describir algo que ya sufrió ese proceso, el proceso de derretimiento. O sea, melt es el derretir cuando ustedes derriten algo y molten es algo que ya está derretido. Entonces, molten rock serían rocas derretidas o pues piedras derretidas, ¿verdad? A buen salvadoreño. Entonces, un, um, un enorme río de piedras derretidas eh, que bajaron hacia Herculanum. Por otro lado, tenemos la palabra cinders. ¿Saben qué significa la palabra cinders? Sin buscarla. Porque miren que a veces tengo esos tramposos que les pregunto algo y repito. ¿Qué significa cinders? Cinders. What is cinders? Cinderos. <laughs> very close. Very good idea. Yeah. In English, there are a lot of words that are um, very similar. So, yeah. It, it's, it's a good idea. But no, not necessarily. Yes. In this case, cinders, we're going to use it when we talk about brazas. Sí, oh, yes. cuando hablamos acerca de las brazas. Ahora, um, no es común que se utilice, porque, por ejemplo, si a ustedes les gusta, eh, ¿cómo se llama? Burger King. Ellos se promueven, ¿verdad? Como hamburguesas al carbón en español. Pero en inglés, no necesariamente se dice así, sino que se dice a la... No, espérenme, no, no era Burger King. Al carbón creo que era otra, porque Burger King creo que sí es en español yes. también a la parrilla. Ajá, Vigues era las hamburguesas al carbón, cierto. Y Burger King era a la parrilla. Bueno, pero el punto es que en inglés también ellos se promueven así, como hamburguesas a la parrilla. Difícilmente hablan acerca de esto, acerca de las brasas. Entonces, es una palabra poco, poco conocida. Eh, pocas personas en realidad, ¿verdad? 
han utilizado o conocen eh, que se utiliza esta palabra para referirse a las brasas. Entonces, aquí teníamos, uh, on the other side of the mountain, cinder, stone, and ash rain down. Sí, cinders, entonces las brasas, piedras, y también ceniza, eh, pues llovía sobre Pompeya. Así que cinders, sí, sería otra de las palabritas que nos podríamos llevar, ¿verdad? Uh, muy bien, bueno, creo que esas son la mayoría de las palabras que habría. Ah, también... Conflagration. Uh, any idea of what conflagration can mean? Conflagration. ¿Alguna idea de qué puede ser? What is that? Okay, conflagration. Oh. Existe en español también y es bastante similar. O sea, esa es una de esas friendly words. En español también se, se usa la palabra conflagración. No es algo que nosotros acostumbremos a utilizar porque normalmente nosotros decimos incendio. Y el incendio pues cubre todo, ¿verdad? En nuestro léxico el incendio cubre todo. Pero una conflagration eh, se usa o se... Bueno, lo, lo que describe la palabra conflagration es un incendio veroz, un incendio muy fuerte eh, que es casi imposible de parar. ¿El por qué en este caso se usa la palabra conflagration? Porque aquí igual estamos hablando, ¿verdad? Acerca de que en este lugar había bastante pues, combustible para poder alimentar este incendio. Por eso es que era mucho más difícil que el incendio parara. Entonces, eh, conflagration se va a referir a eso. A incendios que son casi imposibles de detener. Principalmente van a ser incendios que suceden así, ¿verdad? A raíz de, uh, de desastres naturales. Eh, pues que incluyen cosas que causan más fuego, principalmente erupciones, o sea, no va a haber erupciones o puede ser en el caso que haya eh, un incendio ya sucediendo y luego hay un tornado eso también se convierte en una conflagración, sí, el, el, el juntar ambas cosas, el incendio y un tornado, eso verdad de la destrucción que pueden causar entre los dos porque el tornado alimenta eh, hasta cierto punto la voracidad del incendio, entonces se convierte también en una conflagración. So, that is a conflagration. Um, so, yeah, the rest, I think, oh, wait, poisonous. Creo que poisonous, sí, ¿verdad? ¿Conocemos qué significa poisonous? Poisonous y sparks, esas dos palabras. Do you guys know poisonous what? Uh -huh. venenoso. Venenoso, ajá. Venenoso. ¿Y sparks? Poisonous veneno. Es como... Ajá. Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. All right. So, yeah, I can tell you guys know them already. Muy bien. Entonces, creo que esas son las eh, palabras principales que íbamos a sacar de acá. Muy bien. Por otro lado, entonces, vamos a movernos un poco a esto antes de terminar, porque ya no va a haber chance de revisar la plataforma. Sería más hacer el ruido. Uh, so, let's just see a little bit of what we're going to be working on tomorrow. We have simple past versus present perfect. Um, these two tenses are used in similar ways well not tenses these are different structures but these two structures are used in similar ways for similar situations they have differences of course they are going to be different in some ways one of them is that um, you use the simple past to complete an event at a different at a definite time in the past and you use the present perfect two events within a time period up to Uh, the present. Entonces, utilizamos el simple past cuando vamos a hablar acerca de cosas que pasaron en algún momento, ¿sí? Y que además estamos eh, haciendo referencia, en cierta forma, a en qué momento eso pasó. That will be the idea. So we use the simple past to talk about past situations at a definite time in the past. And we use the present perfect to simply talk about something that we have already done. Sí, para hablar acerca de cosas uh, within the time period up to the present. O sea, para hablar acerca de algo que hemos hecho en un periodo de tiempo hasta ahora. Entonces, eso es eh, básicamente, ¿verdad? ¿A qué se refiere? So, simple past, we talk about... Um, something that happened in the past and finished in the past and we even make a reference to what moments that that took place. And uh, present perfect, 
we use it when we talk about something that we have done. O sea, cuando hablamos acerca de cosas que ya hicimos. Un ejemplo eh, para esto podría ser. Sorry, I went to the park last Wednesday. Sí. I went to the park last Wednesday. Eso es simple past. Ahora, en, simple pre en, en, en present perfect sería I have been to the park. No menciono en qué momento, no menciono cuándo pasó, sino que solo digo I have been to the park. O sea, ya he estado en el parque. Mañana vamos a ver esto más a fondo y cuáles podrían ser algunos de los momentos en los cuales utilizamos uno o el otro. También vamos a hacer la revisión, ¿verdad? Que hoy no tuvimos la oportunidad de la plataforma. Now, for now, I think that is it. That is all that we had to cover this evening. Um, all that I have left to do is thank you guys very much for your attention and participation in this evening's class. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. So have a good one and see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.